All right, ladies and gentlemen, so in this video, we're going to be looking into inductive and deductive reasoning. All right, so let's take a look. As you start to see so far, this chapter is unique. This chapter starts getting into basically no math, right? We're really not talking about much math. We're talking about logic, all right? We're making logical statements because things are true or concluding because they are false. The goals that we're going to apply in this video are to be able to define what inductive and deductive reasoning actually are and identify when a statement is using some logical reasoning, right? So we're going to be able to define whether or not inductive or deductive reasoning is actually being used. Looking a little bit deeper into some things, you're going to be defining both inductive and deductive reasoning. You're also going to define what a conjecture is, what some counterexamples are, and create your own counterexamples. And then you're also going to be able to decide, like we said earlier, if inductive or deductive reasoning is being used. So let's take a look. First and foremost, a couple of our definitions of the lesson is, what is a conjecture? A conjecture is just simply an unproven statement based on observations. That's it. Just an unproven statement about observations. You notice something is happening every single time. Let's say, for instance, you play sports, okay? Let's say baseball, for instance. Let's say you're on a team and... Uh, you have a kid, Johnny, that's on your team. Let's say Johnny is just one big hitter, okay? And he hits third in the lineup. And for the entire game, he gets four at-bats. And so the first at-bat, he hits a home run. The second at-bat, he hits a home run. The third at-bat, he hits a home run. So then you make a statement like, Johnny's already hit three home runs. He always hits home runs. That is a conjecture. It is unproven, but is a statement based on your observations. When you use a pattern to make a statement like this, you are using what we call inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning uses patterns and observations. It is not evidence-based. It is simply an observation. Because going back to my baseball example, we all know that Johnny does not hit a home run every single at-bat. If Johnny did, Johnny would be in the major leagues already, making the highest salary possible. So we know that actually is not true. Okay, So Johnny, yes, he may have hit three in a row, but the statement we made that he always makes home runs or always hits home runs, that is not a proven statement in there. That is inducing a statement, inductive reasoning, because of the specific cases in the first three at-bats. hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. All right. So let's take a look here at... Uh, what we can do to kind of find out a little bit more so about inductive reasoning and these conjectures. So let's take a look. It says numbers such as 3, 4, and 5 are called consecutive integers. I want you to make and test a conjecture about the sum of any three consecutive integers. So I challenge you to pause the video, but let me clarify the question maybe a little bit more so. The conjecture you make is a pattern. So I want you to see what happens when you add up three consecutive integers. Use three, four, and five. Use six, seven, and eight. Whatever you want to use, okay? Find a pattern and then make or induce a decision based off those patterns. So again, challenge you. Go ahead, make a pattern. What did you come up with? Well, let's take a look. Let's use three, four, and five, and let's see what we found here. So three, let me get my pen going. 
So we have 3 plus 4 plus 5. All right, well, 3 plus 4 plus 5, that's a total of 12. All right, let's keep going. Let's see what else we can do. Ooh, why don't we go ahead and just try, I don't know, 7, 8, and 9. 7, 8, and 9. Again, we're adding these all up. We get a value of 24. All right, we have a couple of patterns going on here, but, but nothing crazy so far, nothing crazy so far. Let's try another one and see if you can start maybe seeing anything happening. What about 10, 11, and 12? So what about 10 plus 11 plus 12? That sum right there is a total of 33. You see anything yet? Did you find out anything happening? What about one more to see if you can visualize maybe what's happening? What about 16 plus 17 plus 18 for a total of 51? Did you see anything yet? Hmm. I'm starting to notice something, guys. What if I factored 12 out and said, hey, this is 4 times 3? And what if I factored 24 out and said, hey, this is 8 times 3? Are you really starting to see that pattern now? I think you guessed it. This is about to be 11 times 3, and this is about to be 17 times 3. In all of these situations, guys, we notice that the pattern that we came on up with is that it's always the sum is equal to the second number times 3. So because of this pattern that we recognize, we can make a conjecture based on it. So let's take a look. So a conjecture that we can make based off of this is simply the sum of any three, let me separate this out a little bit, sum of any three consecutive integers is the second number times three. That is a conjecture we can make based off of our pattern. So that would be a conjecture and how it is utilized. Well, so you might be thinking, well, Mr. McGuckin, does this happen all the time? Like, is this actually true? Is it always three consecutive integers added together? Is it always that second number times three? Well, it might be. And the question now is to find out, can you find one that doesn't work? Well, when you try to find one that doesn't work, it's called a counter example in which you find a specific case that proves your conjecture false. Proves your conjecture false. Well, in our example, in the previous one, you're not going to find one. You could go on and on forever, but it's always true. But there are times where the counterexample is actually a thing, where you actually find a pattern and then, hey, what about this one instance where it's false? Like this. A student makes the following conjecture about the sum of two numbers. I want you to try to find a counterexample that disproves this student's conjecture. He states, that the sum of two numbers is always more than the greater number. Let me say that one more time. He says the sum of two numbers is always more than the greater number. Pause the video to see if you can find an example where this isn't the case. What would you come up with? What would you find? There's multiple things that actually found that you could disprove this, but how about just this one that I thought about? Let's say, for instance, we use two negative numbers, negative 2 plus negative 3. Well, we know that negative 2 plus negative 3 actually is negative 5. Last time I checked, negative 2 is the bigger number, and negative 5 is not greater than negative 2. So that would be a counterexample that proves 
our conjecture false in this particular case. All right, let's keep pushing forward. So that is inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning uses patterns and observations to make a conclusion. A lot of times what ends up happening is you think you've created something true because you've seen the pattern and you've observed what's happening. But as we just found, you can find some counter examples of the case. Well, how do we prove something's always going to be true? You gotta use evidence. You gotta use evidence, you gotta use facts, you gotta use definitions, accepted properties, and laws of logic to actually form an argument. And that's what deductive reasoning is all about, ladies and gentlemen. And so, at this point, over the last couple of sections, you're thinking to yourself, what class am I in? I thought this was geometry. I thought I was in math class. I thought I'm getting my math credit right now. I'm talking about logical arguments, facts, def what? What are we doing? Laws? What is happening here? Well, guys, believe it or not, geometry is all about the reason why. Now, if you heard me in class say that, I've said it once, I've said it twice, I've said it a tons of times, because it's true. Our goal with this whole lesson is to start getting our minds to understand that we can't just substitute stuff into the calculator and just throw things in and say, hey, this is the answer. We need to know why things are actually true if we're gonna claim them to be true. Before you go ahead and say, oh my gosh, when am I ever going to use this in real life? If any of you have ever thought maybe about being a lawyer, you have to provide a logical argument using evidence to prove your case. So it has to be happening if you're going to go into law. I tell kids all the time, if you ever want to sit there and try to convince your parents to let you go out on a Friday night, well, you got to have some good evidence and some good facts and some good properties to base your logical argument on and to go ahead and prove to them that you are going to be responsible on that night out. So that is where deductive reasoning comes into play. The difference between inductive and deductive reasoning is the use of facts. Deductive uses facts. Inductive uses patterns or observations. Also on the slide, what you see right now, guys, is the two laws of logic. The two laws of logic are the law of attachment and the law of syllogism. Now, if you need to stop the video at any time to pause it, kind of collect your thoughts, to figure out kind of what's been going on, please, by all means, go ahead. I'm gonna dive into the laws of logic a little bit deeper first and foremost though. So let's take a look at the law of detachment first and foremost. It says that if the hypothesis is true of a conditional statement, then the conclusion is also true. Well, do you maybe remember from anything in the past where this kind of sounds similar? Let me say that one more time. If the hypothesis let's call it P, is true of a true conditional statement that must have meant the conclusion was also true. Remember our truth tables? Ah, remember our truth tables? This is basically saying, guys, that you have P, you have Q, and you have P implies Q. What it's saying is that if P was true and the conditional was true, then it must mean that the conclusion was also true. Think back, remember guys, the only time the implication statement was false was when it was true implies false. So if this was true, there's no way the conclusion could have been false. So that's the law of detachment is all about. What about the law of syllogism though? The law of syllogism in my mind is very similar to kind of like a, a transitive property 
of logic. So here's what I mean. Let's write out what they have here a little bit easier. What if, okay, it says, if P, then Q. What if that is a true statement? So P implies Q is a true statement. And let's also say, so let me draw a little slash here to separate them. Let's say that Q implies R is also a true statement. Well, then it must mean that P implies R is also true. Let me explain. How could you have P implies Q be true, which means that Q had not been a true statement by the law of detachment, and then all of a sudden a Q implies R? That also has to be a true R because we just said Q had to have been true if the result was true. So now we have a true implies a we don't know, but it gave us a true. So that must mean by the law of detachment that R was true. So true implies true is true. Thus, P is true. R is true. So true implies true equals true. Whew, it's a lot of truth in there, but it's great. It helps us out a lot, and it helps us figure out how our reasoning actually works. Let's take a look at a mathematical example. That's how this could maybe look in, in real life a little bit. So what about this? It says, if two segments have the same length, then they are congruent. You know that the measure BC equals XY. Using the law of detachment, what statement can you make? Interesting. So let's say, for instance, okay, that we say if two segments have the same length, they are congruent to one another. Well, you want to say that BC equals XY, the values, that is almost kind of like a P of our hypothesis. So BC equals XY is kind of like the hypothesis of a true statement. Okay. And it will imply some Q that provides us a true statement. Well, we're now trying to ask ourselves, what is a mathematical example that says BC equals XY implies blank that gives us a true result? What does it mean when two measures equal each other? Well, when those two measures equal each other, doesn't that just simply mean that the segments or the angles or whatever it may be are congruent to one another? Right? Doesn't that mean that our segments are congruent? So now we have found a logical statement, what I wrote here in blue, using the law of attachment. So an answer to the question, a, a question like this, is simply this. BC is congruent to segment XY. That would be a valid answer to this question. because You filled in what it was missing. All right. It's a lot, but we're still rocking, we're still rolling, and we're pushing through. Let's take a look at how can we decide whether a statement is using inductive or deductive reasoning. So let's take a look. It says, decide whether inductive or deductive reasoning is being used to reach the conclusion. Let's recap. Inductive meant using patterns or observations to make a conjecture. Deductive reasoning used facts or evidence to prove your statement. So, A, each time Monica kicks a ball up in the air, it returns to the ground. So the next time Monica kicks a ball up in the air, it will return to the ground. What was she using there? 
She kept kicking it up in the air, and it kept coming down. She kept kicking it up, and it came down. Picked it up, and it came down. Her thought is, well, that has to happen every single time. But is that always true? Well, yeah, because we kind of know what gravity does, but there's always different scenarios that could possibly come on up. She just used her observations to make that statement. What if she kicks it up and her little brother runs right underneath, catches the ball, and it never touches the ground? Then her evidence is gone, and that is no longer a true statement, and her counterexample was found. What about part B? All reptiles are cold-blooded. Parrots are not cold-blooded, so Sue's pet is not a reptile. All reptiles are cold-blooded. Fact. Plain and simple, a reptile is a cold-blooded species. Parrots are not cold-blooded. Fact. Sue's pet, or Sue's parrot, is not a reptile. Fact. That is what D deductive reasoning looks like. Using facts and using evidence to make your conclusions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap it on up for this video. Until the next one, I'll see you later.